This week on LTC News, the economic impact of immigrants in Lowell. Additionally, I would say that more than a third of the businesses in Lowell are owned by immigrants. Green power for the people. So the community choice aggregation program is ideal for Lowell because it sets a easy mark to hit in terms of dollars. And Lowell gets a board game. In the meantime, he instilled the uh, love of Lowell into me. And so I like board games, so we started talking. He said, well, why don't you try to see about making a board game of Lowell? All this and much more on this edition of LTC News. Welcome to LTC News. I'm your host, Krista Brown. We start off by bringing you an update on the city's response to the consent decree in the voting rights lawsuit, which mandates that the city council choose two of four proposed voting system options that will go on Lowell's November ballot. The city has published a website outlining the four different options, as well as a detailed timeline on the process of choosing the two options that will be on the ballot. What the website will do is explain to you the history of how we vote right now in law, why there's going to be a change, what the potential changes are, and what the timeline is for those changes. And so uh, this is change that's being um, proposed and that will be um, on the ballot come November of this year, uh, is really the result of um, some litigation that was filed by a group of plaintiffs almost a little over two years ago. And, and so as a result of that, a consent decree was entered into. And that's essentially an agreement to settle a case and for a judgment to enter without anybody admitting there was any fault or any wrongdoing. Uh, and so this isn't about finding fault with our current system. It is about looking to the future and trying to choose an election system that's going to be fair and inclusive. And so under the, the consent decree, it was agreed that the uh, city would um, pick four options and, and put them out in the public for their review. Uh, and then by September 3rd of this year would narrow that choice to two, which the city council will vote on, uh, which two they want to appear on the ballot in November. Alex, I'll turn it over to you to fill in some blanks. Um, maybe just a quick dive into what the four uh, topical options are right now. Um, first option being nine districts. So um, the, there are nine city council seats right now. So the city would be divided up into nine districts um, and you know, representation would be elected from within each district. Um, option two, is a hybrid system with some district and some at large. Uh, there are some sub options here. Um, and so that's, uh, you know, you can explore that through the website. Um, the third is a three district system. Uh, so the city would be drawn into three districts and then um, a number of counselors or committee members would be elected from each of those larger districts. And then the final option is ranked choice where uh, you have a, each uh, registered voter would have a number of votes and then they would rank their choices for so for example their top choice would be would be their highest ranked vote and then their second choice would be the second highest ranked and um, the election would run on a weighted system based on those votes. We'll also be hosting community meetings and sessions um, where people for instance um, lawyers from the law department will be on hand to answer questions. We have um, started the process of commissioning translations, and the translations will be for the, into the language of Spanish, Khmer, and Portuguese, as was requested at the City Council. Um, we will then build separate pages under the website so that um, uh, people can choose the language they want to look at. You can find the website at yourlowellyourvote.org. There are many reasons why one might start to design their own board game, but a shellfish or raspberry allergy might not be the one that immediately comes to mind. 
For Dave Ouellette and Kara Curley, though, that was exactly what happened, as we'll hear in our next segment. When I was younger, when I was uh, 15, 16, that's when I made the first game, the Old Milltown game, and Patrick Mogan um, from the Mogan Center, uh, he was my mentor. I was, uh, I was a troubled teen, believe it or not. Um, and <laughs> I heard that snicker. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, so he helped uh, guide me on the right spot. In the meantime, he instilled the uh, love of Lowell into me. And so I liked board games, so we started talking. He said, well, why don't you try to see about making a board game of Lowell? We were talking one night and kind of came to a conclusion after saying awesome this is and talking about our allergies and decided to kind of put down a foundation. Just basically, we want to be able to educate and help prevent as many allergies and reactions as we can. And so while I was making it, I just figured that we could tie the two together. The reason the board game too is, is because it's about touring the city of Lowell. So it's good because your pieces, you're, you're like walking through Lowell and you're physically getting the, uh, the feeling of the city of Lowell. This is a limited edition printing of this special game, a fun-filled and exciting game of touring historic Lowell, Massachusetts and visiting many local businesses, historic sites and collecting souvenirs. You may even be part of the famous Lowell Kinetic Sculpture Race, enjoy a concert at the Boarding House Park or savor the flavor at one of our awesome restaurants. The other part of this too is we're trying to educate the, uh, the industry. And unless someone's experienced it or have been around it or have seen it, they, it the understanding's just not there, how the severity of how bad it can get. Oh yeah, you know, what are you gonna do? You're just gonna get a couple, a rash? Or are you gonna break out in hives and just go take an allergy pill? You're fine. It doesn't work that way. And so it's, it's stuff like that that we'd like to get in, sit with the chains, sit with the restaurants, sit with the little diners or whatever it is, and just go start to finish in and really help uh, bring change to the industry. I think one of the biggest things is like I found for myself anyways is that I just want to make it more comfortable for people to talk about. Sometimes it's embarrassing because of the way people look at you oh, yeah. and the way that you say things. You know I can be grateful for my friends like Dave or you know I have some of the greatest friends um, that advocate while I'm out. You know I wouldn't be able to go out to a lot of places without you know without my friends. Um, you know and they've been my, probably my, my biggest help. So the idea of the game is you start at home like a tourist. And you'll, be, you'll roll the dice and you'll move the number of spots. One, two, three, four, five. And uh, this one says Songus Industrial History Center. It's at 115 John Street. But the idea is, is you want to collect souvenirs. So when you have this, you can go to either one. So right here, I landed on the old city hall. So you would look at the city hall the old city hall, and you'd pick up the souvenir. And the souvenir is a document that says Lowell is awesome. And so right here it says the souvenir costs $15. So you would take $15 out of your money, you would pay it to the bank, and you would keep it on your side. So once you have all six historic sites from traveling up across the board, you supposedly completed your tour of Lowell just like if you went on an actual tour. Immigration is one of the most talked about subjects of our time and is a huge part of what has made the city of Lowell what it is. On July 10th, the RISE Coalition held a press conference at LTC to introduce a new study written by the New American Economy Foundation about the impact of immigration in Lowell. Chris Coe of the International Institute of New England was a key collaborator on the study. Given the rhetoric of, of the times, it is now more important than ever to highlight the very real contributions that immigrants make to our country and to this city. On July 10th, we officially released the research report to the public. The, over the six month process, we've had different drafts of the report distributed to different organizations and leaders in Lowell to look at and comment on. But July 10th was the official release date at the LTC. The study is called New Americans in Lowell. It's a report published by an organization called the New American Economy. And it was created in cooperation with the RISE Coalition and the Low Greater Lowell Chamber of Commerce. New American Economy is a nonpartisan think tank made up of different business organizations, leaders, and I think city mayors that want to better integrate the different immigrants that arrive in the U.S. The New American Economy conducted the research based on a variety of different sources and the RISE Coalition, our role was more shaping the report and giving them the, both the structure and the sort of, like our vision of what we want in the data. So they, they have resources to collect a lot of different types of information, but our focus was economics in Lowell, education, 
health and wellness and civic engagement. So our report mostly focuses on those topics. Immigrants make up about one third of the population of Lowell, but in terms of economic contribution, immigrants have around $500 million in spending power a year. On top of that, a lot of the major industries in Lowell, like manufacturing, healthcare, and hospitality, like the Indian Conference Center here, all have more than one third in terms of immigrant workforce. So while immigrants only make up a third of the population, they do contribute a lot to the workforce of Lowell. Additionally, I would say that more than a third of the businesses in Lowell are owned by immigrants. So that's another key finding. Without immigrants, Lowell wouldn't have as many wouldn't have as many businesses or as many interesting places to go to. It's important for people to have concrete data and statistics to look at to know that immigrants do contribute instead of just anecdotal stories are interesting, but it's also important to look at facts to better convince people that immigrants are important. The second phase of this is developing the strategic plan and we want to involve as many different community members and organizations as possible so we can have a so it's not like we're writing the strategic plan to tell people what to do, but instead we get input from people who have lived experience in Lowell. And the four different groups of the strategic plan are civic engagement, health in Lowell, economic development, and education. So we want people who have an understanding of those fields to reach out to us and give us comment or feedback on how they think Lowell is doing well in terms of integrating immigrants in those areas and also how they want to envision Lowell in a few years. If people are interested in reading the report or being part of the initiative, feel free to reach out to the RISE Coalition. For more information, visit the RISE Coalition website, risecoalition.org. On July 9th, Lowell City Council approved the motion to adopt CCA, or Community Choice Aggregation, allowing citizens of Lowell to choose fossil fuels or renewable energy to power their homes and businesses. In this next piece, We'll learn more about CCA and how it benefits our community. Everybody in Lowell uses electricity, and when you pay for electricity through your electric bill, one part of it is for the transmission of the electricity, and one part is for the supply. You can get your electricity supplied anywhere you want, and the city of Lowell makes a deal with National Grid, as other cities do, that they will get a certain price for their electricity, and since there are so many different rate payers in Lowell, they can uh, negotiate a better price than one typically could on your own. And also, they can decide what, they, what kind of electricity they want. That's called aggregation because it aggregates all the rate payers in Lowell to purchase as a group. We took it to our subcommittee meeting. Um, Jay helped me out a lot. The whole group helped out with some information, uh, educating myself on uh, the facts and here in Lowell we are trying to uh, reduce our carbon footprint and uh, we made a commitment by uh, 2035 to really try to get up to a hundred percent. We requested that we get 45 percent more green energy here in the city of Lowell and so now the city has it was community choice aggregation, which is we get to choose what type of electricity program that the city is going to use. So what we chose this time around is the 45% green energy. So this is exciting. We're renegotiating our uh, contracts and uh, we got up to 45% uh, renewable energy in this contract, which overall is going to uh, decrease everybody's um, energy costs. So the Community Choice Aggregation Program is ideal for Lowell because it sets a easy mark to hit in terms of dollars and it sets a hugely ambitious and yet realizable goal in 45 percent clean energy additional to the state mandated 14 percent. What that means is that Lowell will now have, unless you default to zero additional clean energy, you'll have 45 plus 14, you'll have, what's that, 59% clean energy in your electric consumption. And that's fantastic and makes an example of Lowell and gives us a chance to teach other communities, other gateway cities in particular, that you don't have to be an affluent community. You can do the clean energy piece and still save money. We're gonna be saving money with this program. We're doing something good for the environment, 
we're paying uh, less for our electricity, and our commitment here in Lowell is so strong that I think we're the second in the uh, state of Massachusetts for our commitment to uh, renewable energy. We're really excited about this opportunity because we want to highlight in the most positive way possible that we can move to clean energy, and this is a great first step in making that happen. In this week's Sunspot, Lowell Sun Enterprise Editor Chris Scott sits down with State Representative Tom Golden. Good evening, everyone. I'm Chris Scott, the Enterprise Editor from The Sun. Thanks for tuning in to another edition of Sunspot. This is my 97th edition, and I'm already thinking about who I should have on for the 100th. But for the 97th edition, I have a return visit from State Rep Tom Golden. Thank Chris, Tom, thanks for coming in. Thank you very much. Thanks for uh, having me. I have to I have to share with the viewers though how even though this is your a return visit, you went to the Lowell Sun offices yep. to do this. Walked right over and I yeah. started pulling at the door and I said, I better get over there. You <laughs> must have been thinking you were at the state house. But thank you for coming in. Yeah, no I appreciate problem. it. Th thanks for so inviting me. So we're just going to talk about a whole bunch of state stuff. Sure. Um, the state has been generating quite a bit of news lately. We normally um, do. <laughs> and um, it's been a lot of it's been fascinating. A lot of it's been um, pretty troubling, yeah, and we'll get into those. Mm -hmm. But um, the most recent thing you guys did is you finally passed a budget Yes. Uh, three or four weeks into the fiscal year. Mm -hmm. The state of Massachusetts had the dubious distinction of being one of... Uh, no, the last. W was it the last? We were the last. Yes, we were. Okay. So, kidding aside, mm -hmm. why can't the governor and the legislature have a budget in place by the start of the fiscal year? We all want that to happen. <laughs> uh, to, to be honest with you, it's, uh, we field many phone calls on this all the time uh -huh. about people having the discussions about why can't you get this done on time, you're late, you're late, you're late. But uh, truthfully, it's about getting it right. And you know, the, the Senate and the House, of course being a member of the House of Representatives, I'm very fortunate. How long have you been there now? I, this is my 13th term. 13th term, okay. Yep. Yep. So I'm very fortunate, but uh, you know, quite frankly, sometimes we feel as though we're right on a particular matter. Mm -hmm. The Senate feels that the, they're right mm -hmm. in a particular matter, mm -hmm. and it's sometimes people get dug in on particular issues. And you could say any issue at all. It really, you could talk about Chapter 70 funding, which um, we had an all-time high this year of Chapter the 70. educational Edu funding to cities and exactly. towns. Exactly. I apologize. Mm -hmm. Educational right. funding for cities and towns. And then you can talk about um, what happened in, what happened with. Um, the, uh, and from the drug side of things, from the, from the world of trying to make sure that uh, Massachusetts stays a leader in the biotech industry, mm -hmm. which uh, pumps a lot of jobs, a lot of revenue into this area. Uh, it just really, it's, it's difficult. I've worked on a... But how come other states can do it? Uh, hmm, maybe, uh, maybe they don't care as much about the issues. I don't know. I really don't know. But uh, well, I... Give us an example of, of uh, cite an issue mm -hmm in this most recent round of deliberations where mm -hmm. the House was dug in and the Senate was dug in that contributed to the delay? To, well, you, not, being, not being on the conference committee, but having served on plenty of conference yes. committees. Yep. Uh, the conference, the conferees should do a good job at keeping it between the six. That's three members of the House and three sure. members yes. of the Senate that bang away until a resolution That's correct. is reached. So what they, I can tell you what my experience has been mm -hmm. as a conferee. Mm -hmm. um, you, you know, I'm from the House, you're from the Senate, you're the lead conferee, I'm the lead conferee. We come together, we bring both bills together, and we literally go line by line. I agree, you agree. So what happens immediately when we both agree is that it gets tossed into the original, the, the final conferee budget. Mm -hmm. So there's no further discussion on, say, let's just make it easy. Line one, no problem. Two, no problem. Five, no problem. Oh, there's a problem in line six, seven, and eight. This is how granular it gets. Mm -hmm. Why don't we take six, seven, and eight, those line items and push them aside for a moment. Are we okay on 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 4, all the way down? Okay. And that gets into the major piece. Well, can you give us, a, even though you weren't in the conference committee, I'm, I mean, you've been there a long time. Yes. And you know, you hear things, you mm -hmm. know things. I have to say they did a very good job at keeping, that you should always not negotiate through the press. Well, that's, that's going to be another question in yeah. a second. But can you give us an example without betraying, you know, bet betraying what, I heard, of, what they couldn't agree on? What I had heard, uh, some of it was educational funding. Okay. Where can we get the money? Where is the money coming from? Can Did the House want to give more than the Senate? The House, vice was, versa? The House was a little bit less than the Senate. Okay. But it's about, it's really all about trying to make sure it's sustainable in the years to come. Mm -hmm. We never want to put ourselves in a position where 
uh, next year we're creating another piece, another deficit, mm -hmm. uh, because that's only going to have people scrambling right. to find out how we're going to cut, where we're going to cut. That was, I would think, one piece. Another piece was what we did in the biotech world about how uh, mass health uh, should be going after some of the most expensive drugs uh, from the bio. Uh, tech industry. Now there's a whole you could to do reduce a, the reduce to the cost. Re reduce the cost. There right. could be a whole segment, and I mean a triple segment, right. quadruple segment, on what is what is right, what is wrong, and how to keep how to ensure that Massachusetts stays the leader in biotech. Mm -hmm. Because obviously, there are some people that are watching today that are probably on this new drug mm -hmm. that is helping them operate on a day to day basis, mm -hmm. and they feel a heck of a lot better from whatever they were drug on the drug, the alpha drug to a beta drug. So there's a lot of discussions about what biotech should be doing and shouldn't be doing. Mm -hmm. And then there's always the questions, why does it always seem like, you know, the, actually the United States is always paying for all the R&D right. research and development. Right. Uh, a lot of countries don't do what we do. You mentioned something earlier about the conference committee, mm -hmm. uh, which meets in, in which, private. Which meets in private. Yep. So that is one of my pet peeves. Mm -hmm. Having covered government on the local and the city level, and a little bit on the state level. Sure, um, I, I would say I, a lot on the state level, I, I, but that's beside the I point. can recall boards of selectmen and school committees and city council, mm -hmm. you know, doing budget hearings in the open, and the sausage making was very open for all to see. But yet, the Mass State Legislature exempts itself Correct. from the public records law, which I think is just reprehensible. What is your view on that? It could be done better. Uh, but once again, you said making sausage is never easy. Mm -hmm. um, well, you liken would, this would to you, an executive would, would session. You, would you support an effort, if one was, were to ever arise, to, to, hold, to so for the legislature to be accountable to the same laws that everyone else is? Well, I'd put it back onto the executive session piece. Mm -hmm. A lot of cities and towns have what they refer to as executive session. And right. they go into but you can't executive. do a budget. You can't do a budget deliberation session in an executive session. I think that there's a lot of posturing going on. I mean, if you're looking at the House and the Senate and just pick any line item you want, mm -hmm. you know where the House is, and they're at hundred dollars, and the Senate's at hundred and ten dollars, and it's usually all about money. And that money is really how do we get to hundred and ten or a hundred or hundred and five and split the, you know, split the atom. Sometimes splitting the atom, and I can only say this from being in situations like this. Um, I would think if it was done in the public, there might be more posturing done. Mm -hmm. um, and posturing isn't going to get the job done. Our job is to come out with um, a final product, a final product that you know, the House, the Senate, and the overall public mm -hmm. can agree with. Mm -hmm. So that's going to be very difficult. I can sit here and give you the popular answer, to be honest with you, Chris, and say right. no. absolutely, positively, yeah, it all should no. be on the open. But when I've actually been in those mm -hmm. meetings, mm -hmm. um, it's extremely difficult because at times, there are some people that are trying to be everything to everybody, mm -hmm. knowing that um, you can only spend a dollar one way. Mm -hmm. You can't mm -hmm. spend a dollar ten. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think, at least from my perspective, uh, from the House's perspective, and we get knocked for this, sometimes we're a little bit, we're fiscally uh, more conservative. And, um, in the sense. Well, than any other. Okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. Right. <laughs> you know. You know, there was another issue in that in that budget. Uh, the the chairman of the Senate Ways and Means Committee, Mike Rodriguez, brought this up. Yeah. Mike Roberts. And, um, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, yes. That's it. Yeah. Thank you for correcting me. No, on it's. That. And with UMass Lowell being here in your district, mm -hmm. he wanted, if correct me if I'm wrong, but like to freeze tuition and fees. Correct. And he, I, I think some um, some people accused him or proponents of that of, as micromanaging the UMass budget. That did not make it to the final. That could have been a fight. That, now, so, not being in the conference committee. Mm -hmm. what happened, I like your views on that. Do you, yeah, and I don't think that was... What needs to be done with UMass? We shouldn't have done that. But, you know, Michael's a friend. I know Michael well. Uh, he and I have not had this discussion, uh, the chairman of uh, Senate Ways and Means, and he's a good man. Um, he has a particular interest or an opinion, mm -hmm. uh, and I wouldn't knock that. That's his, his thought process. But at, at the same time, I think uh, handcuffing any institution, it'd be like us saying you, we can't have uh, any type of increase in the city of Lowell. It'd be like the Commonwealth of Massachusetts saying, city of Lowell, you can't do this. Uh, town of Chelmsford, you cannot do this. And uh, micromanaging is one thing that Do you think he was up. posturing a little bit and trying to send, could, um, send a a Marty Me and a good friend of yours? Yeah. Um, I just message? seen the president last night. Yeah, sometimes that posturing needs to kind of, um, you know, when you talk about these private discussions that are obviously like in an executive session, sometimes you need to let 
some steam off, bring, you know, bring the pressure down on a particular subject matter, bring the pressure down, and let, let's talk about it on another day. And honestly, uh, you know, I've been in situations with these, uh, these hearings, and um, sometimes it's all about that. It's just you got to take the pressure out of the room. Because when there's pressure mm -hmm. in the room, there uh, and, and if people are negotiating through the public or through you know the newspapers, sometimes uh, that pressure continues to rise, and what's that's your, not going to get a good product. What's your take on 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 UMass uh, fees and tuition as they relate to university salaries? Um, you know, the Sun's sister newspaper in Boston, the Boston Herald, mm -hmm. has done some tremendous work on UMass, not just UMass law, but UMass salaries. They are very very. High, mm -hmm. many of the many of the top administrators there and faculty people. I mean, they make more than the governor. Yes. And when when is there some type of when is there a break? Um, it seems that salaries just keep going up and up and up, mm -hmm. and so does tuition and fees. And UMass, when I was applying for college, when I was applying for college back sure. in you know many years ago, I mean back that was nineteen <laughs> eleven. Yeah. <laughs> I'm I mean, the same UMass thing, was. Yeah. I mean. Th that was like an affordable school. That's a school that you know, if you, if you weren't loaded, you'd sure. try to go to. But sure. it's, it seems like it's they're pricing, pricing those people out of the market. Many of the people that they're talking about, especially from the um, professor standpoint, mm -hmm. those are UMass Worcester folks. That's the medical school. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a little bit different uh, okay. in a matter of if a professor who is you know doing some type of surgery or mm -hmm. teach. I don't know what you'd pay them because I don't know what they would end up getting paid if they were working for uh, Mass General. Mm -hmm. That's the whole goal. Those are the folks that a majority of them that, you, that they're talking about that I've seen are actual doctors, mm -hmm. you know, MD doctors. Uh, there are other people, don't get me wrong, that are, I would say, uh, need to be revisited. Their salaries need to be revisited. Okay, well, one of your colleagues, mm -hmm. Tacky Chan, I remember, yes. wanted, um, refresh my memory, he wanted to do some type of review or something. Yes. Or, and, but that got that got kiboshed. That's still discussed. It yeah. is discussed because they do talk about the talent. They do, but when you start to talk about the difference between, um, I don't want to call anybody out on this, but say, I'm going to have to, I guess. We've got uh, two minutes. Boston College, sure. for instance. Okay. Boston College is, I believe, seventy-five thousand dollars a year. But okay. that is a private institution. Correct. But in compared to seventy-five, compare that to eighteen, it's still great money, great bang for your buck as far as getting an education. As a UMass grad myself, I went um, day school, if you would, <laughs> for my bachelor's degree, and then I went to night school for my master's degree. And it was something that was affordable to me at the time while working. Uh, we're getting a little bit out of reach for that at this time, and I think that that's a concern. UMass's? Yes. So that's a concern. Okay, so what do you guys do about it? That's a concern. Your colleague in the Senate apparently wanted to do something about it, but no one else did. In the House. In the, in, uh, well, no, I, I'm, I'm talking Chan. about oh, the other yeah. guy. Oh, okay. um, you know, the uh, Senate Ways and Means Committee. I don't, think, well. I don't think you can um, tie their hands no. without actually having a solution. Okay. The solution to some folks is just more money, and I'm not so sure that that's going to catch up. That's on. not the solution. Yeah. Well, that's right, but that's not a popular thing to say either. Yeah. You know, that's going to be a difficult uh, piece that we're going to pick up on. Um, probably back again in September, October, November. Mm -hmm. The fact that the piece, uh, Senator Roderick's, or Chairman Roderick's, Roderick's. Of, yeah, of you remember that. It's not Rodriguez, right? Yes, it's yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Portuguese. He's a, Portuguese, yeah. he'll remind you. Okay, yeah. So uh, Senator Roderick's um, has come, th come this far. Once again, pressure was lowered in the room. We closed a deal. But I don't think you've heard the end of this. Okay. I think September, October, November, there's going to be another push to do something else. I'm just not privy to it at this time mm -hmm. because it was, once again, uh, during that conference committee, I have to give a tip of the cap to the conference committee because they did what they were supposed to do. They kept it as tight as I've ever seen on Beacon Hill, which is occasionally, uh, uh, you know, leaks like uh, the Titanic. Mm -hmm. um, and that, they, they kept it pretty tight, right. which I think is a good way of uh, getting the pressure out of the room. And at the end of the day, pushing out a good product. All right. Well, Representative Golden, I want to thank you for coming in for this 97th edition of Sunspot. Maybe you will be the 100th. I would like to be the 100th. 100th. <laughs> thank, thank you very much. Thank Thanks you for coming in. For and that's all for this edition of LTC News. You can find us on LTC channels 8, 95, and 99, online at ltc.org, on Roku in the LTC News playlist, or on Facebook at LTC Lowell. We leave you now with footage of Kerouac Park's reopening. I'm your host, Krista Brown. Thanks for joining us.